Good evening, everybody here in the U.S., and good morning, folks over there in Australia. I know we have some Kiwis who said they were going to be on, on board for this discussion over there in New Zealand. I'm excited for tonight's interview. Uh, Peter and Gillette are both have had huge impacts in my practice, both from two different perspectives, but uh, I'm excited to have them both here with us tonight to have a, a great discussion. I think having the clinician voice, the patient voice, and also a researcher voice uh, in this discussion is going to be, you know, Peter being both clinician and researcher, uh, it's going to be a, a unique discussion where I think we can have some some good points brought up and we'll probably discuss a little bit about Peter and Gillette's interaction at the San Diego Pain Summit. I was just discussing with those guys how I, I envisioned that not going as well as it did just because I thought Gillette Belton is the queen of pain science. She has figured it out and, and conquered her pain. Um, but obviously there were some things that really came out of that interaction that I was Huge eye-opener for me, but we'll talk a little bit about that. But before we do that, I'd like to have, Gilletta, why don't you uh, just kind of, most folks know you, but if you don't mind introducing yourself, and then we'll pass it to Peter, introduce himself, and then we'll start the discussion. Sure. I'm Gilletta Belton. I'm a blogger at mycupofjoe.com, where I kind of try to make sense of my experiences living with pain through science and stories. Um, and I've, I've been writing that blog for probably about five years years now. I've been a little absent from it this year, but that's because a bunch of other things were going on. Um, part of those other things are that I'm also the co-founder and executive director of the Endless Possibilities Initiative, which is a nonprofit with a mission of empowering people living with pain to live well. And we do experiential learning retreats and workshops for people living with pain. So we had our first first responder retreat this year and our second women's retreat um, this year. And it's, it's just an awesome thing that I'm really proud to be doing. So that's pretty much it. Great. Peter, why don't you introduce, most folks know you here, but uh, maybe there's this stray person who doesn't know who you are. If you don't mind introducing yourself. Hi, I'm Peter O'Sullivan. Um, I kind of wear a couple of hats. One is uh, a clinician. So I work um, half-time in a clinical practice, uh, predominantly seeing people who have got stuck on their journey with pain. Um, so they're usually people with long stories who are really just caught in what we would commonly see a cycle of pain and distress and uh, the inability to do the stuff in life they love. So it's a very privileged position that I have as a, as a clinician. Um, the other part of my, uh, my work life is um, a professor at Curtin University in Western Australia. Um, where I'm part of a wonderful team of researchers that um, have been exploring the underlying mechanisms, the stories, and um, the possibilities for change of people with pain. So we've um, particularly been working in the space of back pain, but we're now broadening our focus towards um, other persistent pain disorders, hip, back, uh, neck, um, et cetera. Great, great. Now I'm going to let Gilletta take the lead of the interview because I think this is an interesting opportunity for the patient to to interview the clinician slash researcher. So Gilletta, why don't you take over and 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 ask Peter your burning questions? Sure. Um, well, my my first question, and it kind of speaks to how you thought I was going to be a bad patient demo, and I kind of thought I was going to be a bad patient demo too because. I'd been studying pain science and graduate school and that kind of stuff for so long. And I had been doing really well with my right hip pain, but prior to the, the pain summit, the 2017 pain summit, I'd been having left hip pain for about seven months. That was new where I'd had the right hip pain for, for seven years at that point. Um, and I, I did not know all that I thought that I knew, but, out of the, the three years where my pain was really bad in my right hip, I had gone to a, a, a lot of different clinicians, um, over a dozen over the course of those years. And the thing that most surprised me about my interaction with you, Peter, was when I first sat down, when we first sat down in front of the group, the first thing you asked me was to tell you my story. Um, and I, I just didn't even know where to begin. I actually asked, where do you want me to start? Because it was such a surprising question to me. So my first question is, um, why did you start with that? And is that your normal approach when you're working with, with people in the clinic as well? And why? Yeah, spot on. Um, <laughs> it is the first question I ask everybody <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's whatever it is. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that's frustrated me as a, um, 
as a clinician is I, I really struggle with this idea of putting people into boxes. And so the historical um, view of um, that we were taught in terms of, um, you know, dealing with someone who has pain is you start ticking boxes. Um, I've never done well with boxes. <laughs> uh, and I think what it does, it kind of dehumanizes people and it doesn't tell you something about the story of that individual. So uh, there's a really in interesting push towards a narrative view on health um, where the person's story is the key. And I, look, uh, my view is, um, you know, within the first minute of that person telling their story, something absolutely critical will come out of it. And, and it gives the person to, to it kind of taps into something central about what is going on for them. And often you'll hear a variety of things. You know, you may hear, um, I can think of various things that people might say. I used to be this really fit, strong person. And now I'm, you know, I'm weak, I'm fragile, I'm broken. Um, I, my back is wearing out. I'm getting old. Um, uh, you know, I've got a degenerate disc. My, it's this stuffed. Um, you know, my core is weak. You know, we hear something that taps into really implicit beliefs around um, people's understanding of their pain or, or you know, I I'm feel lost. I'm stuck. You know, and I think that narrative view is about giving the person that chance to tell their story. And my, my perspective on... Um, Reflecting on my clinical practice is that um, my, my view is, and I've said this before, is that when a person comes to us, they come to us with a jigsaw puzzle of all the pieces in a box, but they've lost what the picture looks like. Um, and we sit down together and we kind of map out what those puzzles might look like. And then you turn it around and you ask the person, was that what it looks like? And very often there's this kind of sense of, that's it. <laughs> you know, you've helped me unravel all my pieces, but the person's brought the pieces in. It's not us that gives the pieces. Right. They bring the pieces. And, and I think that's the difference between a person centered care model versus what historically has been. And I think is so present in the health environment, this practitioner model where you tell the person how it is and you direct them and you educate them rather than saying, actually, you, you've you got the answers in that box. All the bits are sitting there. And my job is just to see if we can work together to kind of piece that together to make sense of that for you. Yeah, and that was exactly my experience too, because I almost surprised myself with the story that I told, because I didn't tell the story about the pain that I was having in my left right. hip. I went right back to the hip pain that I had felt in my right hip that had led to the loss of so much, you know, to my identity, yeah. my career. Yeah. And I didn't realize until we had that discussion how much I feared losing everything again because I had been doing so well for so long. Mm. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm going to – I had three major questions, and I'm going to jump to the last one um, because of what you just said. So the way that that demo went – the things that really stuck with me was the beginning where you asked me to tell you my story. And then the end, when you summarized everything on the whiteboard, kind of that putting all those pieces together. Mm -hmm. And the way that I, I have talked about it is that it helped me connect the dots. It helped me right. even see the dots because it was a visual representation right. of my story. And it was you, you used my language too, the mm -hmm. things that I had said during the course of that. So it was a, a very visual representation of what that was. So it was kind of like the old story was presented, but then a new narrative that we had kind of co-constructed along the way during the course of that session was presented as well with, with the path forward. Um, and, and to me, the, those were the most powerful elements, and both are so story-based, you know? It's, mm. it's that listening to begin with and then, and then kind of summarizing at the end, but also presenting a new way forward or a new narrative as well. Um, can you walk through that process at all? How you do that with the whiteboard and, and mm -hmm. bring a person's story together? Like, are there certain elements that you look for to put on there or is it all driven by the patient's story? Um, look, I think um, you might've read the paper that um, Sam Bonsley led in JSBT around the common sense model of understanding pain. Um, I think it's a really useful model. It's a, it's, it's a health 
uh, an illness perceptions model called the common sense model. It was proposed a number of years ago by a chap called Leventhal. Um, and it kind of applies to a lot of health conditions. And it, it kind of presupposes that um, any one of us could have a health issue. Um, and that will be influenced by a whole bunch of things like your contextual factors, um, you know, what's happening in your life at that point in time. And that transcends across time as well. Um, and we create a representation of what's happening with, you know, it's like that representation is what is this? So if it's pain, what is it? What is it? <laughs> you know, what are its consequences? Um, you know, what's the timeline? Uh, how do I manage it? Um, you know, like, you know, what, so they, that we create a construction of what's going on and that construction is influenced by, um, you know, our history, our social environment, our, um, pain experiences in the past, our interactions with other health practitioners, et cetera. And based on that representation of, you know, what is going on. And, and I think just in saying that we can hold um, explicit views, we can, you know, I, I can think of numerous times when people say, yeah, I, I'm not fearful of this. And you say, and, and then when you examine someone, you ask them to do something that they're avoiding and it unleashes this fear that they didn't even know they had. So, I think I'm kind of wandering a bit here, but that idea of this representation of what, what this health issue means to us is so complex and it's often not something you can access just in an interview. And that's why we strongly um, embed behavioral experiments within that process. And we'll come to that in a minute, but um, the way we, represent our problem influences our behaviors. So it influences how we hold our body. It influences whether we relax or we hold tense. It influences how we move. It influences how we engage with the world. It influences the decisions that we make to engage with work or not engage with work, physical activity, social situ situations, etc. And based on those, that complex of interactions, that also feeds into our emotional responses. So those responses may be fear or worry or um, anxiety or um, sadness or loss or, or anger or frustration or, you know, grief or a whole host of emotions that then feed back in the loop. And so when we um, piece together someone's story, we've kind of got that framework in mind of saying, so what are the, what's the historical factors, the contextual factors? What is, that, what is your representation of what you think is going on? What are your core beliefs uh, around what is happening and how you should manage it and, and what that means for you in your life? And what are your thoughts around the future? How are you behaving with that within your body and within your interaction with the world? And how does that feel for you? So within that, there is a construction around that vicious cycle, but it is entirely about your narrative. So in a sense, we're just filling boxes um, and your words fill those spaces. And from that, it kind of creates this picture, um, which is pretty evidence informed. And if you look at, I really recommend your listeners to, to read Sam Bonsley's paper called a common, un a common Sense Understanding of Pain-Related Fear and Back Pain. Um, I think it's a really, really cool paper. And, and that came out of her PhD uh, research where she was um, interviewing people who are really who with high levels of fear who had disabling back pain um, and and so from the interview the interview really merges you know historically in uh, physical therapy we have these examinations that are really weird actually if you think about it we do a whole bunch of formatted tests that may completely have nothing to do with the person's experience. So that almost creates this dissonance where the person's saying, these are my problems. And then you're, you know, the problems may have nothing to do with lying down on the bed. And then you spend the whole session lying someone down on a bed, right. examining them, which is kind of weird if you think about it. Like <laughs> how do we get from one thing to another where we're interested in the person's experience? So, you know, if you have a problem with, um, you know, when you're sitting or standing or loading or running or bending or lifting, that's what we're interested in. Um, and so it's the observation of the behavior and then the non-judgmental experiential learning process of saying, so I'm, I'm seeing, you know, for example, you know, you're telling me that you 
feel like you're holding this tension in your body. What is that like for you? You know, so I'm noticing that when you hold yourself, you're holding this tension. What are you feeling? Why are you doing that? So that kind of pulls out these implicit beliefs. Well, I'm doing that because that's good for me, isn't it? Well, everyone knows that it's good to sit up straight and brace your core, don't they? Or, and, and some of these are conscious things and some of them are completely unconscious. Like, do you realize that every time you load your legs, you hold your breath? Do you notice that when you get out of a chair, you never load that leg? Do you notice that when you go to pick something up, you always lead with the non-painful leg? So these avoidance behaviors are things that people don't even know they're doing. And, and I think what I think what we understand from um, modern neurobiology is that we can hold explicit beliefs. You know, this are things that might be even, you know, things that we think we believe. <laughs> often <laughs> They're not things that we really believe. And I, I don't know if you've read the book called Blink. Um, it's a really cool book, but it kind of talks about people saying a great example of that is um, you ask someone who they're attracted to. And they go, oh, yeah, someone who's really sensitive and kind and gentle. But when they do speed dating, they're attracted to these aggressive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> narcissistic human beings. You go, well, you think you're attracted. You think this, but actually when you're put under pressure, actually your implicit beliefs are somewhere else. And I think we see that with pain. People go, yeah, this is what I think. But actually deep down inside, something else is lurking that's driving these behaviors. And I think it reflects this idea of that our, within our construct of our nervous system, we often hold disconnect between our emotional brain and our cognitive brain. <laughs> so right. we can hold these explicit views, but deep down inside, these fears are driving behaviors. These fears and worries are driving behaviors that are so powerful. They will influence um, protective mechanisms within the body that cannot be consciously overdriven. Yeah. Well, and, and that, that sets up my, my other question so perfectly too, because that was exactly my experience during the demo um, and the, the um, behavior experiments that you were talking about. Um, for me, because I mean, I had written like six posts on movement variability and changing postures and not holding any one posture. And then part of the demo was you having me go from sitting to standing to laying on the ground to doing all these different things where I was actually holding the same, you know, extended posture and all of those. And a complete unawareness on my part that I was doing that because I thought mm. I was moving in all these ways. And I know how beneficial changing up postures and moving in all these ways mm. were. So my explicit belief definitely did not line up with my yeah. implicit belief that yeah. especially as my pain started coming back, I started holding those habitual mm. postures more and for longer um, mm. and all of those things. So we, we did in our demo a lot of um, – of those kinds of experiments. And as Mark would say, when he talks about it, he talks about you hammering me with all of the squats and the <laughs> lunges. Therapeutically. And all of that. Therapeutically. <laughs> it was therapeutic hammering. I mean, that was definitely fatigue. But what, yeah. what really interested me afterwards was that many of the clinicians that I interacted with after that, because um, I wrote something like four blog posts mm -hmm. on that interaction, that a lot of people focused on the exercises as though yeah. it was like the, the series of exercises that were the, yeah. the magic. And I'm like, I never even did the homework. I never did any of those things again yeah. after we left there. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that you can speak to that a little bit and what the purpose of those behavioral experiments are um, yeah. and how you come up with them. Like what you, huh. what you're Well, driving. I don't come up with them. You came up with them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the key. Um, like, you know, patient-led care or person-led care is about the person leading you to the things you explore. So you led them to me because you were telling <laughs> me that you had problems in terms of, in my memory, sitting, standing, yeah. lifting, running, loading the left leg, um, lying. They were things that I explored because you told me they were the things that were, you know, creating barriers for you. So, so that idea of I will only examine things and, it, and this, of course, I'm screening um, to rule out, um, uh, you know, pathological drivers of pain. Um, then I will screen and ex explore the things that you're telling me are the things that you fear that hurt you or that you avoid. Um, 
and you know where some people are not you know well some people are not aware of avoidance but that becomes critically clear when you start exploring the things that people say they have problems with and that you'll you may they may not avoid the task but they may avoid bending during the task they may avoid loading during the task so you can engage with a pain provocative task but usually the body will set up a defense while engaging in that task and the other things that we at, at first you know, at least you need good eyes, you need good ears, you need good eyes, and then you need an exploratory brain um, to not prejudge what that process is going to be because it is an exploration and it is non judgmental. And I think so much of what we see in our profession is so judgmental. We tell people how to sit, we tell them how to bend, we tell them how to move, and that just defies our understanding of the beauty of human variability. Um, you know, what we know about pain is that often it reduces our variability because if something's threatening us, we go into protective mode. So, um, you know, that, that process is led, was led by you. Uh, and all I did was observed your behaviors while you did those things. And then I set up experiments to see what would happen if I gave you strategies to reduce your protective mechanisms during them. Uh, and I think you tap into something else. And, and that is, um, you know, often PTs have a frame of reference is it's about an exercise. And so we will look at a whole interaction and always can see as exercises, <laughs> right? Where, where a psychologist would look at that interaction and not see a single exercise. All they right. would see is the human interaction and the behavioral experiments. Right. Um, and so it really comes down to our point of reference. And, and, and that's really important for us to explore in ourselves is to say, what is my bias? What is my point of reference too? Because, you know, we paint the world through our own lens and it's almost impossible not to do that. Right. Um, uh, but the broader we can create that lens, the less judging our approaches are and less risk constrained we are into the way in which we work with people i think yeah i agree can i'm gonna say can i add one thing mark because i know you're gonna yeah. jump in but yeah. um because it, it's that latch on to the exercise and I'm, i suspect that you might talk about that a little bit mark is something that i see so consistently because it, it, and that's the easy thing to latch on to too yeah. because then you just prescribe an exercise and then that yeah. fixes things and then we're good yeah. but what, what that really did for me, because, and, and I've written about this um, too, after that I went running, because that was one of the things that I had started avoiding and, and wasn't mm. doing anymore. Um, and you had, when you hammered me, I was doing everything in a flexed position, which was mm. not physically difficult so much as cognitively difficult because I was mm. doing it wrong, <laughs> you know, doing mm. all those things wrong. Um, and as I was running, I would try to like flex and be a turtle and do all, I had all these um, sayings to myself to make myself um, run in a different position that wasn't that extended, protected, kind of guarded position. Yeah. But so for me, those experiments weren't about the exercises at all. It was kind of just rewriting that narrative and challenging those implicit yeah. beliefs that I had. And also, you know, I still had mm -hmm. those fears that I said that there was damage in there. Like as much yeah. as I knew, as much as I had studied yeah. pain and understood the complexities, I went right back to kind of a damage narrative. So challenging those beliefs through doing those yeah. sorts of things allowed me to create a, yeah. a different story with credible evidence, not just yeah. from the literature, but also my own, yeah. what my body was doing, what yeah. my my abilities were all of those sorts of things and to me that was the big takeaway yeah um that i hope that coming from this people will start <laughs> thinking yeah. about a little bit um, yeah. differently but and i and i think that's so helpful because if you think about how we learn over time is we you know there's so much evidence now emerging around the role of memory is that we can learn fear memories or we can learn safety memories and those things kind of they kind of um, compete with each other. And for some, you know, for a lot of people that we see with pain is they've learned a lot of, they, they've got a lot of embedded fear memories, um, you know, and so those, those historical memories for you, which took you to a really dark place, were kind of unleashed when you develop pain in the other hip. Yeah. And, and they brought with them those, those old emotions and those old behaviors and protective responses and, 
um, that makes complete sense from a neurobiological point of view. And the only way you can really test the validity of those memories is through behavioral experiments. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you're hip and I have this conversation probably every day in my, in my clinic world is that, um, you know, if you were, if your hip was damaged, then loading the crap out of it should have made you so much worse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so in a sense, you tested the validity of your own belief system. I didn't, you did. Yeah. And and that's, that's why that, that learning is not about me telling you, it's about me asking you about your experience and me creating opportunities for you to test your own beliefs uh, rather than it being me saying, look, let me sit down and explain pain to you and <laughs> in, a, in a very cognitive way, try to reassure you, which is not reassuring at all to someone who's got these deep seated beliefs that are linked right. to historical, a, a, you know, a, a dark period of your life where they've been deeply embedded. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this is what happens when we see people have pain exacerbations. They can be, I can think of so many people are just going so well and then an event will come and it like unleashes these old memories yeah. that um, kind of build, kind of pull you back into that old space. And, and, and the person, you know, some, we see people panic, go to ED and you know, it's like the catastrophe and it's like they can't think in that space. Um, and one of our greatest challenges is preparing people for the inevitable, inevitability that that may happen. Yeah. So that you, you can say, look, you know, pain is a common phenomena and it, there's a really good chance from what we understand about pain that you may develop pain again and that that may be a confronting and threatening thing to do and let's set a plan for you when that happens. And if that plan's not working, get back in touch with me straight away so we can support you through that plan again so we don't get plunged back into that old space. Love that. I'm going to jump in here with a question because this has been a great discussion, by the way. Um, one of the questions I asked you at the San Diego Pain Summit was, you know, your use of pain neuroscience education. And you just right. had spoken there about, you know, how, it, you know, maybe that cognitive approach where you're trying to, you know, explain pain and get into mm. some of this stuff. Um, I was kind of surprised when you said it wasn't a big part of your practice. Then watching you practice and then reviewing, you know, seeing your videos and things on YouTube, it makes sense because you take much more of a experiential learning kind of let the patient confront their own theories and beliefs, which I've yeah. seen, obviously you see powerful examples in YouTube, but you also in implementing in practice, you can see some amazing mm. with that too. I'm curious kind of where you kind of fall, you know, where, do you think, mm. you know, that P and E pain neuroscience education has a moment of or place, or is it still something you feel like experiential learning is maybe that more kind of that approach versus that cognitive approach may be, more powerful? Um, you know, I'm not a black and white kind of guy, so sure. it'd be straight up. So I think it's got a huge place for me as a clinician um, to have an understanding of the neurobiology of pain. I think it's really important for clinicians to have that understanding, but it's also important for clinicians to have a deeper understanding of their own implicit beliefs and behaviors around pain as well. Because one of the things that we, you know, I gave this example earlier at the EP3 um, conference in Melbourne um, when we had a, a man who had had um, 35 years of really being very disabled with back pain and he'd been told not to work, couldn't run, uh, couldn't play football, couldn't lift his grandkids, couldn't ride a bike and he was so distressed and quite broken um, emotionally and very fearful. And I asked him what his um, three most feared activities were. And one was bending, one was lifting, and the worst was bending and lifting, twisting. Um, and through that um, behavioral kind of experimental process, he was highly guarded and protective and had avoidance behaviors and around loading and flexing his back, as is so typical. Um, and I, you know, I got him bending. And he was surprised it didn't hurt him. And, and, and you could see him just nodding his head going, I haven't done this for years. It feels so good. Like the thing that I most fear feels so wonderful. Um, and then I had him lifting and you could see this kind of <gasps> collective gasp from some of the people in the audience going, I'm going to hurt this guy. 
you know, this guy's got like seven out of 10 pain and he's protected. He can hardly get off a chair. And here I am getting him to bend down and lift 10 kilograms. And then I said, right, now we're going to bend and twist and lift. And there was this, <gasps> now, these are all people attending a European neuroscience workshop about Dims and Sims. And it, and it kind of elicited this deep guttural fear, <laughs> not in all, but in some. And, and one of the participants came up the next day and said he had had experienced significant back pain in his life and he felt viscerally sick watching this guy doing exposure work. And I, and I think what, you know, I'm kind of going around about here, but, you know, the fear is embodied. You know, fear around pain is embodied. It, we embody it. It is not just here. <laughs> and so I can, you know, we often see this. People come in and say, look, I'm, you know, I understand this, but at the end of the day, I'm not doing A, B, C, and D, and, and I'm frightened to do it safety learning is about doing now i think for some people and i i i i'm sparing in who i do i to me i am explaining pain neurobiology by explaining that common sense model cuz they are the the beliefs and the behaviors and the emotional responses that feed neurobiology now for some of our patients, they want to know more about the me underlying mechanisms. For others, they just want to get living. They don't really need to know. They just need to know it's safe to go back to work, to ride a bike, to play with their kids, to go for a run. That is enough. For others, they may come back and, you know, we always send people away and say, look, I want you to go away and think about this and bring back questions. I want you to set your goals. I want you to plan now for the future of what that might look like set short-term and long-term goals. And they may come back and say, look, you know, this is really challenging some of my beliefs. Can you give me more information? And that's one of the things that we've, you know, we've done is put up patient stories because the narrative again seems really important. And knowing that someone else has walked a journey that's never going to be the same, but might look similar can be really helpful. But then we would steer them to other resources um, around understanding more around the, uh, you know, the biology of pain. But, you know, surprisingly few ask, surprisingly few. The majority just want to get living again. They want to know it's safe. They want to know whether it's safe to get on the bike, kick a ball, play with their grandkids, get, get going again, because that is about safety learning. And that's, an, that's what enables. I think we're pretty, pretty primitive creatures when it comes to it all. And, you know, the cognitive stuff, it, you know, Part of it is cognitive, but the real learning can't occur, I don't think, around that until you've taken through that process. That's my bias, clearly. Um, that's, sure. I don't have great evidence for that, but that is my bias. But that is, that's kind of the experience I mean, that I've had as well. And it kind of makes sense to the conversations that I have with a lot of clinicians as well who, who uh, we you know, we're going to put a blog up with someone who's just gone through a CFT training program. And one of the things she said is I'm doing way less talking and I'm doing way more reflecting and behavioral learning. And it's really changed how I practice. And it's so much less taxing on me as a practitioner because I'm not working so damn hard to convince someone against something that goes against their grain. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's an interesting perspective. And I thought one of the things you, you spoke about already is how this fear is embodied as far as it, it's embodied to the point it exhibits itself in changes in muscle tone yeah. and tension and things. Yeah. And, you know, our training as physios, we're, our construction of that experience as far as how we're trained is to look at it very biomechanically and yeah. you know, muscle imbalances and yeah. different things that we yeah. know are obviously science is questioning. And yeah. I, following your work, I know you've made a big transition over your career uh, to yeah. kind of go from that maybe construction to the construction you um, obviously yeah. really did with Gillette and the patients that you've, yeah. you've, you do it with. I'm curious, what do you uh -huh. think like for a, for a physio to, what, are, what is, how can a physio make that transition? Because hmm. you also mentioned there are implicit beliefs that we yeah, huge. often don't even recognize we have. And I, and I know I run up against them sometimes and have yeah. to challenge my own thinking a lot. Yeah. I'm just curious yeah. what you'd recommend as far as a pathway to start maybe yeah. that type so, of So we've got a couple of projects that we're running at the moment. Ian Cow, 
Um, it's based in the UK and part of his PhD is looking at a training program um, uh, with physios um, to kind of train them in this process. And he's just published a paper actually in, um, and just came out this week, which I can feed you the link about the experience of physios going through that training program. What are, one of the things that we, we're understanding more and more, and we're doing another study in Australia, which has been, you know, why I haven't traveled at all this year. Um, well, one of the reasons, <laughs> um, because it's been such a taxing time is to kind of uh, take people, you know, basically see whether we can create competency at doing this kind of work. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly challenging. And one of the things that we think, one is you have to have a cognitive understanding of the processes, like the dimensions, you know, understand the, the science behind it, understand, you know, some of the pain neuroscience, but very much the behavioral sciences as well. Um, you need core communication skills. You need good eyes. You need good, you need to, you need to care. <laughs> it's really important. If you don't care, you shouldn't be doing the game. <laughs> you need to deeply care about human beings and, and, and being able to park your own judgments and your own prejudices, I think. And one of the things that really distresses me when I watch Twitter is some of the judging that goes on. It's terrible. Um, uh, we hold, you know, we hold prejudice big deeply, I reckon, as human beings, not all of us, but we all hold some. Um, uh, and then the other part is um, uh, you have to do it and you need what we think is you need to have someone uh, watching you do it's a, it's a bit like, you know, learn to drive a car. You got to understand there's a car. You got to know that there are these bits of the car. You got to understand the concept of driving a car, but at the end of that, you got to get in that car and you got to make mistakes and hopefully they're not fatal, but, but the doing is the key. And then having someone to sit with you gently prompting, identifying, these moments and it's one of the thing that's been really interesting is watching the implicit responses of physios when they're dealing with people's stress often when uh, like often we're not comfortable and, and you know some of the systematic reviews have shown this that pts are not comfortable asking people about how they feel uh, when when the person starts crying they quickly change the conversation because they're not comfortable with that person's distress they don't know how to handle it they're not comfortable with asking them about their social situation. So, you know, we, we're writing a paper at the moment, at the moment um, this idea of what are the key competencies that we need to embed within our profession um, to upskill people to dealing with people, you know, who are, who are you know, struggling with pain. Uh, and these are competencies around communication skills, about person-centered care, around motivational interviewing, around good observation, around reflective learning, behavioral experiments, around, um, you know, education, person-centered education, goal setting, et cetera. There are a multitude of skills that we're kind of understanding more, I think, now. Uh, and part of the research we're doing at this point is to explore what we need to do to develop competency in those skills. So I have, a, I've kind of done a long answer to you, but it's what we know is that just attending a workshop doesn't do it. <laughs> but <laughs> bottom line, you've got to, you, that's just like looking at the car yeah. and going, Oh, I can watch someone driving the car. It's not driving the car. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like I was at the International Association for Study of Pain. I spoke uh, or asked you on Blaine and I can't remember the gentleman from Denmark, I believe, who was up there talking as well about exposure based treatments because traditionally looked at as more of a psychology driven treatment. Yeah. And it seemed to be I mean, I may have misinterpreted, but there seems to be some in the psychology world that don't maybe think that's a PT's place to do it. But it's like, how do you not have psychology involved in a pain? Ridiculous. I hear this all the time. Just, you run up against it is, any? It is completely nuts. I mean, you tell me if you've got an Achilles tendonopathy, what are you going to do? You're going to load their tendon. That's exposure. Mm -hmm. You've got someone with a patellofemoral joint pain. Quads exercise is exposure. Stepping is exposure. Single leg stand is exposure. Riding a bike is exposure. You've got someone with neck pain who's got a limitation in right rotation. Right rotation exercises are exposure. That is nuts. 
That's my answer. It's nuts. I mean, Completely nuts. I mean, you know, I, you know, I've been really fortunate to to work with some really, um, and and I I was at a conference. I, I doubt that's Johan Vlaan's perspective. No, was it, it, it was not. No, exactly. I was at a conference with him and um, uh, Stephen Linton, and one of the things they were looking at was the CFT model, and and I think that you know there is an interest across different disciplines that this is tapping into like a middle space. And I kind of see that we've kind of, we've got the psychological therapies here and the physical therapies here, and there's a middle space that's not being well represented. And I think there's a need for training in that middle space. No, and, and that, let me be really clear on this is my, I am not trained as a psychologist. I'm not, I'm not treating people whose primary complaint is depression or anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress. I'm managing, I'm working with people with pain and often I work in tandem with psychologists because there are, you know, come with mental health problems that need the support of a psychologist. So, you know, I, I'm very clear about my scope of practice and that I'm not ever trying to work as a psychologist. I'm working with people with pain to create, help them create an understanding and to develop, um, safety learning to get back to living uh, that's how i see what i what, what what our role is and that's a really important role that is often not met by cbt because they don't really explore the behaviors because those behaviors are not just about do i go to work they are embedded in the body right. those behaviors are embedded in the body so you talk about my background in terms of the biomechanical perspective and I had a very much a structural biomechanical view on the world and the experiments and the research we did just didn't support the view. So we had to update the view. And so the, the, the research work and the work with pain, people with pain forced me down this path of realizing that what we were observing actually was human behavior and those human behaviors are driven by deep cognitive biases or beliefs and emotional responses to pain that's what we were tapping into i think what that's what we were seeing and it's a really helpful way of for me to kind of see a broader picture of understanding movement as a behavior absolutely gillette i don't want to keep uh, drumming questions up here did you have anything else you wanted to pose to peter no but i did have a comment on the um that whole like the the pain neuroscience education and those kind of debates that are out there and, and how much education is appropriate and, and those questions always seem a little misguided to me because if you start with where Peter starts with that the person's story and it becomes person-centered care then helping them connect the dots like that answers that question what bits mm -hmm. do they need to help them yeah. make sense of things yeah, and then fun. then you use what your knowledge is because everyone yeah. should have that knowledge it's working with yeah. pain you should have That's a deep fun. understanding of the science of pain so that you know yeah that what you're doing to a patient is, or with a patient is safe and that you know yeah. why these things are important. But yeah. if, if it starts with that person-centered approach and that kind of narrative approach, I think it fixes all the rest of those mm. debates, you mm. know? They, they then drive the path forward and, mm. and that's, I, I am completely biased, obviously, <laughs> but that's how it should be. <laughs> but as, you long recognize as, we, as long as we recognize it. <laughs> um, one of the things as a, as a clinician and as a researcher, and as a human being is trying to say, this is my belief. <laughs> we don't have, I have any data to support it, but that's where I sit. That's my current belief. Now to be completely, you know, someone has watched my trajectory over time. Um, they'd see that I've had to update my beliefs continually and I hope I continue to do so. And I hope that I acknowledge where, you know, and, and that's why I'm, I try to be very careful about the statements that I make is not to be too black and white because we're just not working in that space. You know, we don't, we won't work in a world of absolutes. <laughs> we de we're dealing in a world of complexity and a flux and, mm -hmm. you know, that those processes so you know the other thing i think that that taps into is this idea of that common sense understanding is constantly updated and adapted and changing and morphing and in flux and so you have to re-update and readdress how that might shift it's like a it's kind of like an evolving shifting process 
and, and it's not static. Yeah. Um, it's so much of our diagnostic criteria are static. You're dumped with a label. It's not humans. Human beings don't work like that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It kind of has some parallels with predictive processing and those priors and things that people construct as far as this sensory expectation or, or things in the world that they expect to encounter. Um, I think it's just fascinating with that stuff. It is. One question, because you know, you, you, you definitely brought up what we see, especially on social media, it becomes this dichotomous extreme or one extreme or <laughs> another. Um, it drives me crazy. Yeah, it's, me too. It can be an ugly world to navigate, of course, but. Uh, the, the, the one topic that a lot of folks in our group often, you know, wrestle with, uh, you know, and, and this is one that I personally wrestled with in my career is, you know, being went through the manual therapy fellowship training and, you know, part of all that. And, and definitely, it can, yep, exactly. I, it, and find some value in it. And it's, and, but then you have these two extremes of like, oh, it should have, you know, we should be just trashing manual therapy. It's a useless thing versus, you know, oh my God, everybody's just, the pain science folks are just talking to people now. They're not even laying their hands on people. How do you think we can better, you know, encapsulate because uh, therapy within, you know, updating our views, you know, and a lot of this embodiment of some of these beliefs yeah. and fears and things that we might be conceptualizing maybe as a facet joint dysfunction or something where this protective behavior gets labeled as some meat and bone dysfunction. I'm just curious where, where you think we can, you know, find a middle ground in that whole discussion. Yeah. Look, I think the world of manual therapy is kind of enmeshed with a whole lot of crazy and not defendable belief systems. So mm -hmm. these dysfunctions that we hear about, these instabilities, these um, imbalances, all this kind of language that we embed within the laying on of hands, um, I think discredits this, that whole space. Um, and I've put out on social media my views number of times about and we we talked about it in that cft paper as well as the role of putting hands on people touch is so powerful now i, I don't actually remember Jaletta, but i presume that i would have touched you yeah exactly but what did that touch communicate do you think <clears throat> to me it was more i mean it wasn't it wasn't, um, it wasn't specific, like it was more reassuring and, okay. and uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it, it wasn't the typical, uh, I don't know, it's really hard to put into words. It's not how previous encounters with physical therapists have would, gone. <laughs> sorry to butt in, but if I was to put some words to it, it was supportive versus correct. Yes. Correct. That, that is a perfect analogy and, and cueing kind of like, Got it. like paying attention to this area here, what is going on here. And then being able to sense changes. Like when I was sitting in the hair, the chair and super tense and just completely unable to even slouch, <laughs> you know, those types of cues to be able to draw attention to what that felt like and what that was. I, I love that characterization of more as supportive, not corrective. We're trying to fix anything which is mm. how I feel like my previous interactions had been. It was putting me in the right position before, exactly. you know, those types of things. Like and, and look, I think that corrective um, perspective comes with risk. Um, you know, it, it, it presumes that you're in charge of the person's care. It is about me delivering care to you. It's about you being passive to my, and a recipient in my care. And that's always a tricky place to be in. Now, that's not just saying <laughs> I don't know, very, really, very, and this patient specifically said, I don't want you to touch me, which is really unusual, but it has happened. Um, I would invariably use my hands. And I, that's, to me, I'm grateful for my training in manual therapy. I use it very differently to how I was trained. But to me, it's about um, education, you know, to touch if the tissue is hypersensitive to just to put your hand on that on those structures and make the person realize actually that the pressure that you're applying is not going to damage them but it's acutely painful it's a wonderful way of illustrating what hyperalgesia or allodynia is um, to identify the tension within muscles is a reflection on the protective guarding that may be happening with the, within that individual um, to facilitate with the person and, and this is where 
you know, for some people, if they're unable to make those changes actively, then that's where we'd see a role of facilitation with, with touch. Um, but it's, it's, it should be always empowering and it should never leave the person dependent uh, with the belief that you're fixing something dysfunctional about their body that, they, that creates a dependency to come back for more. And, you know, there are positions that I really, they, they, they leave me with a deep sense of um, distaste because I've been trapped in that before as a manual therapist. I've, I've created dependency before. For people and and i you know i kind of hold a view that um if if you're dealing with someone who's not disabled you know they're living well and they've got a stiffness in a region of their body then manipulation and you know passive treatment is not a problem and that's you know they pay for it it's a service you can give them pain relief i have no problem with that but to someone who is really stuck and that's where i have a great problem with it is and that's and sadly, the group that I tend to see mostly of people who have had needling and pushing and manipulation and uh, they're not living and they're kind of trapped on a dependency cycle and they have no active coping strategies and they've got low self-efficacy, in my mind, that is, that's contraindicated. But touch is not. <laughs> right. But, but right. treatment in that situation, I think, in my view, is. And, you know, it's another paper that I'll write when I get the time because I have, I have quite um, emerging views on it where, where I think it's really helpful. And, and it, it comes down to that, you know, we've been involved in this um, study this year. We've seen about 80 people with disabling back pain. Only one has asked for hands-on treatment. And I come across this all the time um, with physios who say, oh, but my patients expect it. Now some may, and we had one who did. Um, <laughs> And I worked around with her to, to identifying that actually her goals were way more than symptomatic relief. Her goals were actually to start engaging with living again. And so she shifted across that session to changing her expectation, but it was pretty tough. Um, now there may be some people who, as I said, you just need to support them in that very first, but be very clear about what you're doing. I think, and be very honest about what it is that you're doing and the, the expectation of how long that benefit will last them. To me, it's no different than giving a pen at all. Um, you know, we're not fixing people by pushing on them and cracking them. Yeah. I mean, it's just interesting. Like we said, it's just the discussions get ugly and it, you, you lose the nuance and different things. Yeah. And I think you put it very nicely as far as kind of how, we can still utilize some of the skills, but definitely our narratives Absolutely. be updated, just like science is asking us to, yeah. and, sci and you have yeah. followed along with your career and, and changed yeah. your, updated your beliefs. Yeah, but exactly. It just, I just think there's just this cognitive dissonance, and like you said, these implicit beliefs we hold that. Yeah. Just, look, it's a and, and look, and look I think we, we defend our turf fiercely. Yeah. And so, you know, our identities are so tied up with our beliefs. And so, you know, you see that in politics. Wow. <laughs> You're part of the world. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. But you, <laughs> you realize that, you know, we will defend our beliefs until the, we die, basically. And if mm -hmm. we're adherent to them, we will ignore all evidence in defiance of our beliefs. All evidence is nil to defend your beliefs. And, you know, we hold you know, pain beliefs that are no different and probably more powerful than political beliefs, I think. And, mm -hmm. and as manual therapists, we hold some really fiercely held beliefs and some are more fiercely held than others. And there are vested interests who are selling those beliefs and they're making money out of them and there are businesses that run off them. And so you got a problem. Yeah. It, it, I, I think it's, you know, some of the comparisons, not obviously near the, the disabling experience of patients, but I think clinicians almost go through this biographical suspension of sorts when they're, and I, when I've really had to question my manual therapy training, again, not to, there's some very useful things like you had pointed out, yeah. but a huge amount that was definitely not maybe in the best interest of what we mm. now understand to be maybe best practice and care. I just think it's a scary place for a lot of clinicians. And like you said, can turn into a lot of ugly. Yeah cognitive dissonance like yeah. driven behavior so yeah and and look you know as an educator and as a researcher i'm very 
cognizant of um, not trying to dismantle someone's um, sense of worth and self in terms of what they do, um, but to kind of say, let's update it, let's shift it. Mm. Not, it's not like you're binning one thing and you're going with another thing. It's that dichotomous thinking is really unhelpful. It's just kind of like, let's support you to shift. So it's kind of a nudge process rather than a supportive process rather than saying, that's crap and you need to do this sort of thing. Sure, sure. Well, mm-hmm. Peter, I want to respect your time, and but I'm gonna, Gillette, do you have anything else you wanted to, to pose to Peter before we finish up? No, I don't have any other questions, I don't think. Um, I just have really enjoyed the conversation. And, yeah. And that is enough. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I'd like to say, Gillette, I think um, – I think your, your insights have been really incredibly helpful for us as a group. Um, you know, I think more and more, you know, we, that, that conversation around that relationship between um, the clinician and the, the, the person, the individual that you're working with, it's such a critical, it's like a dance. Um, and, you know, we so often only hear the voice of one of the players, but the critical player, the critical player is often the voice unheard. Um, and I think what, what you've done is to give a, some of your beautiful and really insightful perspectives on that process, which again, it's so helpful to us to go back and self reflect and look at how, you know, how we might be communicating what's going on. Cause one of the things that we've found really, really hard is, how to create a clear narrative for people about what we think are key components of good care. And that's still a process of learning and we're really, really responsive and open to that feedback. But, um, you know, the, the role that you've played in that has been hugely, um, you know, we, we really, we're very grateful for that. Thank you. That means a lot to me. It means more than I can say. So thank you. No, I would echo those sentiments. And I, I love what you said, Peter, about the dance. And I think the, watching, you know, your perspective and your, and your way of caring and, and CFP and, and learning a lot of these behavioral perspectives, it's, it's all about letting the patient lead the dance instead of us as clinicians Got it. leading yeah. that dance. So I really yeah. wanted to thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure. It's offered and your time. Um, we really appreciate all the awesome work you're doing over there in Australia and look forward yeah. to seeing what you guys have coming out next. Yeah, good on you. Thanks so much and lovely to chat to you both. All right. Take care, guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.